Okay, maybe I'm not done. I want to leave you, Destiny, but I can't do it because I hate you. The wizard's here. It's dying in breath. Eat the eyes. Still lost once. Until they did. It's been a minute since I last played Destiny. In fact, to ensure that I wouldn't, I instantly sold my copy of Destiny 2 on eBay right after I made my video, vowing to never play it again. However, things change, and honestly, I just find it interesting to talk about. Initially, when Destiny 2 launched, it was met with thunderous applause. Everyone was talking about how good this game was. The campaign was revered as being almost as excellent as a Halo title of old, and the game still sits with a very respectable 85 on Metacritic. Then what? 24 hours passed? And controversy after controversy led to Destiny 2 winding up being one of the most bashed and disappointing games of 2017, just as it deserved. Like in the original Destiny, they released two expansions after release. We'll talk about those in more detail in a moment. They were arguably so embarrassingly bad that the future of the game seemed pretty hopeless for many. Fast forward to the latest paid expansion, Forsaken, and history seems to be repeating itself all over again. Destiny 2's Forsaken expansion might be the best the series has ever been, says The Verge. IGN calls the new story memorable, awarding it a very solid 9 out of 10. With a darker, more nuanced story, loads of activities and clever tweaks to its core systems, Forsaken vastly improves the quality, quantity and structure of content in Destiny 2. PC Games N reports. It's all looking very positive, but remember children, Context is important. Sure, after playing Forsaken myself, I'll give you that it's slightly better than Destiny 2's vanilla offerings. So yes, in comparison, it is marginally better depending on what aspect we're talking about. However, it's still quite bad in a number of different ways, mostly in regards to the story. In the four years that Destiny has existed, it's established itself as being about as engaging as Crochet. Now don't get me wrong, plenty of people enjoy Crochet, but what I mean is that it fulfills the same need of a pretty mindless, repetitive action that helps to kill a bit of time and keeps you busy. Except the biggest difference being that instead of winding up with a nice blanket or something, all you end up with by playing Destiny is repetitive strain injury from pressing the shoot button so much. I think it's fine to enjoy Destiny for simplistic reasons such as I'm bored, shooting feels good, it's something for me to do, me like loot. But you have to admit that any real potential is totally squandered in favour of milking its player base for all it's worth. Using manipulative, scummy business tactics that bank on you getting addicted to its total mediocrity through its occasional bursts of dopamine and scarcity tactics. Ultimately, Forsaken doesn't change the story issues, mechanical failings, or lack of overall direction or cohesion in the world building of this series. It's still a muddled mess that only really excels at a small handful of things that it's trying to achieve, and when it does work, it's not in any meaningful way that can convince me that it isn't already being achieved elsewhere in the industry to a much greater effect. It's basically confirmed at this point that the original Destiny was a complete disaster behind the scenes, with the production over at Bungie, leading to this shell of a game being shambled together at the last second. I was willing to forgive this, it was an ambitious idea, until I played Destiny 2, which mind-blowingly also looks to have been plagued with similar development issues which is completely inexcusable for a game of this clout. How do you manage to learn from your mistakes, but then also make the exact same mistake again? What on earth is going on behind the management of this series? So in typical Activision Bungie style, I don't even separate them anymore, instead of allowing their development team enough time to finish what could resemble a finished product, they threw together what vaguely resembled a AAA game and expected their audience to effectively pay for a beta to give them enough time to fix it, and then eventually charge another premium for access into content that resembles the state that Destiny 2 probably should have released in to begin with. Does all that sound familiar? Well it should because this is exactly what happened with Destiny the Taken King two years ago. The Destiny Reddit seems to be more than aware of this. But it's not fool me twice, shame on you. It's fool me once. There's a reason so many people see this series as an embarrassing joke. I'm sure that from this footage you're thinking, well, this don't look so bad. And that's how they get you. That's how they get you every time. They've gotten so far on superb art direction, massive advertising budgets, and this air of mystery. Because that, that's all they've got. That is all they have got. Destiny is like the most gorgeous building ever designed, but once you go inside said building, the walls and foundation 
are made out of toothpicks. Again, there are still things to like about Destiny 2 and its expansions, but my god, how the mighty have fallen. I'm going to apologise in advance if I end up repeating things that I've mentioned in my previous Destiny videos, but the same problems just aren't being addressed, so I have to keep bringing them up all the time. So with the setup out of the way, let's quickly go through Destiny 2's first two expansions so we know exactly where the story is at the start of Forsaken. Obviously this video is going to be full of spoilers, not that there's really anything significant to spoil. If you hadn't noticed already, this time I'm playing Destiny 2 on PC instead of Xbox One. Partially because I didn't have any clue which version I was supposed to buy on console, but more so because I managed to get the entire game, first expansions, and Forsaken for pretty cheap. I only mention this because Destiny doesn't have cross-play or the ability to move characters across platforms, so I had to start a new one. The newest Forsaken expansion comes with a one-time use item called a Forsaken Character Boost that when used skips over all of the previous campaigns so that you're ready for Forsaken. So in order to even play Osiris, I had to make a new character grind my way through the vanilla campaign, then continue to grind up just to be strong enough to even partake in the content. This is something that would have been fine at the time of the release of this expansion, but is retrospectively extremely frustrating for a lapsed player, who has completed vanilla on another platform, but missed out on the expansions. This would not be a problem if they did not force you to own Destiny 2 and its previous two expansions to even play Forsaken. Of course, I want to play what I've been forced to pay good money for. Destiny 1 gave you the option to replay levels. I don't know why this is a necessary change. Anyway, it took me just over two hours to complete the main story of Curse of Osiris. That's including cutscenes and loading screens. The cutscenes themselves make up about 12 minutes, if you're being generous. Like, I'm not looking for any sort of arbitrary length in particular, but it does give you an idea of what you get for your money here. Personally, I'd always prefer two awesome hours of content over 10 hours of boring, monotonous filler, but hilariously enough though, the two hours of content here is basically nothing but filler. I found the setup of the story to be genuinely quite intriguing. That was mostly when my imagination got hold of the concepts though. The actual storytelling itself is not good at all. It starts off with some guardian who is established as being able to travel through different simulated realities thanks to some complicated Vex technology. It's kind of a weirdly similar setup to that really bad piece of DLC for the original Mass Effect called Pinnacle Station, if any of you remember that one. But during one of the simulations, the Vex shoot at him and he gets stranded in the program called the Infinite Forest. At least, I think that's what happens. It was skipped over so fast that upon revisiting the story to try and describe it to you guys, I really have no idea why or how anything happens. Basically what it boils down to is the only story Destiny knows how to tell. There's a new freak of the week that is threatening the entire galaxy and you need to kill it. This time it's a big Vex creature, the only new enemy in the expansion. You'll mainly be fighting the usual waves of enemies that are still being reused from the original game. A couple of the Vex are reskinned at least. I guess that's something. They don't behave any differently though. The only interesting idea that this DLC has is that thanks to this infinite forest concept, they're able to show you scenes from the past and possible future. There's a pretty good moment where they show the before and after of how the Vex transform planets to suit their liking, giving good, much needed context and explanation as to what the hell these enemies are and what they're actually trying to achieve by showing it to us instead of just telling us like Destiny always does. The Vex are probably the most interesting out of all the main Destiny races. There are some really good concepts in there. And it's still such a shame that with the amount of time I've spent in this universe that I still feel like they've only scratched the surface on who anyone is and why anything is happening. There's a new map on the planet Mercury, which looks pretty cool, but is quite small and sparse. And unfortunately, all of the missions on this planet boil down to you running into the infinite forest, jumping and killing a bunch of enemies on various platforms until you kill some kind of mini boss and then repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. The campaign variety is so half-baked that they force you to even go back to the EDZ map from Destiny 2 Vanilla in a desperate attempt to inflate the length of the content. Every mission is usual Destiny level design, which of course is pretty much only one thing. At the end of the DLC, you kill the big baddie in a semi-interesting boss fight, and then it ends. There are a couple new strikes, and a public event, and the usual stuff, but you really not just give this out for free? Like, it's pretty worthless. The best thing about this content is the new music. 
nothing new there. And of course the art direction, also nothing new there either. There really is nothing else of note. I don't understand why this is necessary to own in order to play Forsaken, aside from the fact that they need to reuse old content to pad out the new stuff. It's a shame that they've now wasted the infinite forest. It could have been used as a framing device to explain more about this universe's past. Oh well. Once I finished Osiris, I had to grind some more and able to be able to play, possibly the worst piece of content ever released for Destiny. I think Warmind might be the most insulting con job this fraud of a series has ever tried to pull. That's including the Dark Below as well, which was also pitiful. This one I managed to beat in barely over an hour, and the cutscenes hardly scrape over 10 minutes long. Of course, they reskin the worst Destiny enemies ever created, the Hive, by putting ice on them this time. Great, because new creatures to shoot at would obviously be too much to ask for in the game series that is all about repeatedly shooting at enemies and literally nothing else. These bionicle looking fools, they're just not fun to fight. Yet again, they set the story up with an overly produced, slickly animated, unnecessary fight scene, introducing an incredibly lame new character called Anna Bray. Guardians aren't supposed to investigate their past. That's the rule. What? Since when was that a rule? Anyway, the story of this expansion is that you need to kill a giant worm because that's what the hive worship, apparently. All right. It's a giant worm! They're sinking cities with a giant worm! The dialogue brings me straight back to the that wizard came from the moon garbage from the original beta way back in the day. We found a golden age research facility buried inside a glacier. Where do you think? Meet me at the entrance to Clovis Bray. Again, they completely waste all potential with the War Mind, an ancient artificial intelligence for strategic warfare that has been teased in Destiny for countless years. And the only reason I know any of that is because I read the wiki before writing this. At the end, once you kill the giant worm, you go to communicate with the War Mind itself finally. I am Rasputin, guardian of all I serve. I have no equal. What have we done? Don't worry. We've got this. What do you mean we got this? That was the most menacing and foreboding setup I've ever seen. I wonder where this story's going. We've got this. Oh, that's that's the end. Must the end of the, the story. This shit's like a bad Skyrim side quest. And they expected money for this? It really seems like they've learnt nothing. These DLCs would be disappointing even if they were free. They always introduce these cool looking new areas to set the campaigns on, but they always send you away to old maps from old content within the first couple missions because the gameplay is so limiting that they can't think of what else to do to pad it out. Of course, both of these expansions introduce more levels, strikes, maps, and loot to grind for, but it's basically all made irrelevant because of the release of... Okay, let's stop talking about old shit and let's talk about something new. First and foremost, Destiny 2 Forsaken has a brand new story, which everyone seems to be complimenting for being darker and more focused than ever before. Except when you actually play it and really think about it, the story sucks. Anyway, to start the expansion, I made a new character with the same character creator from Destiny 1 that still hasn't been updated. Really good in the game that's all about customizing your character, huh, folks? And then I used that boost that I mentioned earlier, so I was ready to play. Once you get past the ridiculous bombardment of informational pop-ups and notifications, ignore the constant dot on the map that's trying to get you to buy the annual pass, and then head over to the microtransaction hub in the tower that gives you a reward for accelerating your journey to the reef. Hmm, I wonder why they get you to do that. You head over to the Prison of Elders and the new story begins. Uh. 
Any last words? <coughs> How's your sister? I don't normally like complaining that much about cliche tropes, but I guess we are talking about Destiny, so... But a cut to black gunshot? Not a fan of that. It's not even one of those ones that's left up to mystery, because they show you him dead in a scene later anyway. We cut back in time a bit to the Prison of Elders, a location from one of the first Destiny expansions. That expansion wasn't very good, by the way. Where we're told that there's been a breakout, so of course it's our job to clear up the mess. Just another day at the office. All right, partner, this is a Cade Riff in six. Watch me for the changes and uh, try to keep up. Now let's go to prison! <laughs> Those of you with special ears may have noticed that Cade Six sounds a little Nolan Northy, and that's because for some reason they didn't get Nathan Fillion back because he couldn't make it. So you're telling me that the one character that added life and made Destiny even remotely interesting couldn't make it for what could potentially be this character's last ever appearance in the expansion that completely revolves around him. Right. Well, this, this is awkward. I'm not trying to knock Nolan North's performance because he's a really good actor and he does a fine job here. It's just so distracting because Nathan Fillion has such a unique voice, cadence and delivery that it's extremely difficult for anyone else to recapture. He literally made that character what it is. Without him, there is no Cade 6. <clears throat> You run through the prison, killing the usual enemies, while this amazing piece of sweeping, swashbuckling music called Gunslinger on the soundtrack plays. I say this every time, but thank God for the team of composers working on this game. It really helps capture the mood and tone that they're going for, because it sure ain't the cardboard characters that do it. It makes what would otherwise be pretty mediocre events seem so much more impressive and grand. Just imagine hearing this in a story that I actually care about. A man can dream. How did these guys even get guns? A lot of the dialogue is still delivered through the somewhat detached comms, no changes there. The environmental team did a pretty good job filling this first level with interesting details. Can I just say I'm having the time of my life right now? They make it feel more alive than the usual Destiny level. They even have characters interact with you in person. It's almost as if it's a real video game. Again, showcasing how a much more linear and controlled setting works much better for communicating story information to a player instead of a vast, static museum-like map with exposition delivered by nothing but dull phone calls via your ghost. Okay, there is a big Vex signature just up the coast. Let's kill it, whatever it is, and bring it to my core to one of the old Academy <sighs> Research Labs. Destiny's been pulling this trick for a while. Hey, let's just make the first level good so we can trick people into thinking that we've actually changed everything. Nope, it's normally just the first level and the last level that they put anything remotely interesting in. Everything in the middle always sucks. The actual mission design is nothing special. It's the setup of a chaotic prison riot that helps drive the gameplay along. There's a pretty dull moment where you have to fight waves of the worst enemies ever. The Hive. Cade does some more funnies, and you're treated to a pre-rendered, glossy cutscene. No, 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 no! Cade! He's gone! This isn't a prison riot! It's a prison break! So to stop this mysterious he from escaping, Cade drops a huge platform in what feels like a moment from Guardians of the Galaxy or something. He explodes himself because remember that Guardians are invincible as long as they have their ghost. That's very important. Better. Cade is greeted by a bunch of fallen looking creatures and deflates all tension by turning into Deadpool for a minute. And cue the ominous music. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one, Cade. <laughs> There's a stupidly long, unnecessary fight that I guess has some fun choreography, but I'd much rather his character be developed more instead. I can see this shit anyway. You're constantly just showing me Guardians fighting all the time. I'm already doing that in the game. Like a dumb idiot, he gets out his ghost, which gets sniped and destroyed. Which, remember, now means that he can die. He says that he's coming home. I'm coming home, Ace. Which no one would understand 
because they never explicitly explain what he's talking about. I had to look at his wiki page to find out the answer. I guess he used to be a human or something, and he had a son called Ace. It's kind of massively important that we know that before you try and make a dramatic moment out of it, otherwise it's just confusing. You're back to playing and you've got to try to get to Cade. You find what's called an ether trail, which is wrong somehow. Ether trails. Look out for escaped fallen. But this ether is wrong somehow. It's just nonsense. You're introduced to a new enemy who look like weird headless zombies. Of course, it's instantly revealed that they used to be the fallen. These things. They used to be fallen. Well, that's fun. The fourth time they've been reskinned as a new enemy type, if you count their original form, the Seaver from Rise of Iron, the Taken, being reused in Destiny 2, and now the Scorn. Well, I guess that would be five. These Ravager enemies have a weak spot on their flame thing, so exploding them with that feels pretty good and has really satisfying sound design attached to it. Thumbs up there. Literally anything that isn't constant headshots is refreshing in this game. Next, you meet these teleporting creatures called Raiders. They seem more like a direct reskin of the Fallen. They're serviceable. Next. My favorite new enemies are these things called Screebs. They aren't mechanically any different to the same exploding suicide grunt-like enemy archetype every race in the game already has, but that animation is fun nonetheless. Look at their arms flail. You fight a demented abomination, which is kind of like a headless hive ogre that can shoot lightning out of his hands for some reason. Again, they're serviceable. Once you beat it, you head on through a door, find Cade's body, and then you're supposed to fill in the time gaps with the cutscene we were shown at the beginning. So this blue guy is supposed to be the same dude from the original Destiny, the one who did nothing and wasn't a character, who then in the Taken King expansion, if you remember, you don't. Was shown to be flying a little ship as Oryx sent out a big pulse explosion and then presumably died. but I guess he didn't die because here he is. Cade 6 has his final moments with your player, where he makes fun of you for being speechless because your character never says anything. Speechless. <sighs> Typical. And he has a genuinely great last line of dialogue. You tell Zavah and Ikora, the Vanguard, is the best bet. I ever lost. So let's talk about why this death scene doesn't work. <coughs> One, Cade isn't a character. He's a fun character archetype, and his personality and performance is good, but we know absolutely nothing about him, unless you read his wiki. Two, the same thing applies to his killer. The blue guy, who's not a character we know anything about, so it's not shocking or interesting. It's a shame all the content before this has been so underdeveloped, because if this guy had been built up and properly written as an imposing villain or something, this could have been an actual good setup for a revenge story. 3. Is there actually a chance that this is permanent? I know Bungie have said that this is supposed to show that death is a very real thing in this universe, but why would they choose Cade? Unless Nathan Fillion really wanted out or they couldn't get him back or something. He's basically the only character anyone knows from this franchise. Are you telling me they've permanently removed the face of their game? He's been all over the marketing ever since people attached themselves to him. All I'm saying is don't be surprised if this character comes back in the future. Number 4. For some reason they used Cade's death all over the marketing as the biggest draw to pull people in. Which sure, is alluring, but they blew the one surprise they had. If this had happened out of the blue, this would have been so much more effective to me. Would have raised the stakes. But ever since I saw the poster, it's like, oh, I guess Cade's dead then, okay. Now what we're left with is the boring, identical non-characters back at the Vanguard. This is on the head of Aldrin Sav. But if he thinks what he's done is the end, it's not. It's the beginning. What is with this dialogue? Of course it's not over, because you said it's not the end. Who wrote this? The bald woman wants to send every guardian ever born to murder Cade's murderer. But the bald blue man says, We need to keep our eyes here. On our home, our people, the traveler. 
The scene is weird because they're both right and wrong at the same time. Sure, it's unreasonable to want to send every single Guardian to the Reef at the same time, because that'll be absolutely moronic, but doing absolutely nothing as a response makes the Guardians look weak. So why not compromise somewhere in the middle? Isn't that the whole point of having a sort of council vanguard type deal? Why not send a small team of perfectly capable soldiers like Shax or Hawthorne to exact revenge to show that you can't mess with Guardians without consequence, especially one that everyone seems to know? and is kind of a huge deal. Surely these guys are a very real threat either way. Who's to say that they wouldn't eventually coordinate some kind of attack towards important guardians or the tower in the future? It's not like we haven't been sent to deal with threats in a preventative way before. It's basically the only thing we ever do. Hell, the last DLC was about killing a giant worm that presented a possible growing threat, and Zavala himself even came along for that one. How is this any different? If anything, this should encourage them all more to be proactive because whatever tactic they're choosing to do is not working. I refuse to bury any more friends. You won't have to. Ultran Sarv is mine. So my character has a voice again? Why bring the voice actors back to do, like, nine words? What is the purpose of this? Anyway, the reason this entire setup is so bad and nonsensical is because they desperately wanted to tell this personal revenge story. Except they somehow forgot that for a revenge story to be personal and impactful, the lead character needs slightly more motivation than some random dude killed that funny guy that I sort of knew. Think about any number of stories with a similar setup. In John Wick, his dog, which was his last reminder of his dead wife, is killed. Personal connection. In Kill Bill, the bride is put into a coma because her ex tries to murder her on her wedding day. Again, personal connection. What about a literal western, like True Grit, which is about a girl trying to avenge the death of her father? Personal, emotional connection. The point is, without that personal driving motivation, it just seems hollow. My guardian isn't even a hunter, so why would this be such a personal attack to him? I do really like that they tried to go for a smaller, more personal story that is a lot less lofty, with direct inspiration from classic revenge western stories of old, but nothing about it makes any sense based on the entire setup of the whole you're one of many thing from the original game. Especially when contrasted to the original campaign of Destiny 2 where the entire theme and point of the game is that everyone needed to work together, guardian or not, to exact revenge on the evil villain that wronged them and took what was theirs. It really isn't that much of a difference. I wish I could help you more. But the city needs a unified vanguard. Or at least the illusion of one. And this is your road now. So if you completely ignore this section here, that is unfathomably lazy and convenient in its setup and writing, the story is simple and effective for what needs to be done. All you need to know is that Cade's killer, Aldrin, and his fallen barons are gathered on a stretch of the reef called the Tangled Shore. For all intents and purposes, this expansion has the exact same story as new Super Mario Bros. Wii. I'm not even trying to be facetious. Listen, you have your princess stolen, or in this case, brutally murdered, and the rest of the game is you taking on bosses one by one until you get to Bowser, or Aldrin. I think gameplay-wise, this is a good setup, but as far as a memorable or genuinely good narrative is concerned, though, well, I mean, no one's raving about the story in New Super Mario Bros. Wii, are they? You embraced me when I was cast out. There's another dumb cutscene where Aldrin, the villain, gives a motivating speech to his fallen buddies, encouraging them to cause chaos for some reason. Go, unleash upon the fallen. Chaos. It's revealed that Aldrin is hallucinating his sister, the Queen, who he's weirdly obsessed with, and she has an abysmal line that goes, Love is fleeting, but devotion. Now that is forever. Love is fleeting, but devotion, now that is forever. 
Destiny loves this kind of writing. It's this dialogue that sounds cool and weighty when these dumb space aliens are saying it. But then when you sit back and actually think about it for a second and remember that love and devotion are completely interchangeable because they are literally synonyms for each other, then it kind of falls apart. I can't believe so many people genuinely think these stories have improved when really they're still pretty similar in quality to the very first game. For now, I'll just say that his motivation is that he's completely crazy, so nothing he does even needs to make any sense. You'll see what I mean when we get to what is actually making him hallucinate later. It's pretty bad. The Tangled Shore. A lawless frontier of outlaws, scavengers, pirates. Murderers like Aldrin and his fallen would fit right in. Finally, it's time to explore a brand new area. It's basically the Wild West, but in space, which is pretty cool. At first, I thought they were going for a much more open type of design, because the only direction you get at first is find Cade's killers. So I thought maybe I'd be exploring the map and would have to find clues to hunt down the barons all by myself. But then I remembered that this is Destiny, and it has to be designed for stupid dum-dums who need constant hand-holding. So a quest marker eventually pops up and shows you where to go. After you defeat what feels like 600 million waves of the same enemies over and over, the woman from the first level hits you up and it's like, hey, come with me and meet my friend the spider. Then for the first time I can think of in Destiny history, you actually fight alongside friendly AI players. I'm sending you some backup. Please, don't shoot the backup. Sure, it's a small thing and they're reskinned fallen and they're basically completely useless, but it does help to make the world feel slightly more frantic and alive. You have to kill four huge waves of enemies, then finally, Shine your shoes, Guardian. You're about to meet the spider. <laughs> well, if it isn't Petrovenge, the worst jailer in the solar system. <laughs> what brings you to my home away from home? Away from home. On the run, are we? I heard you lost the shore. God. You lost my shore. This spider guy is freaking cool. His design is amazing, his whole room looks pretty great. The performance by Robin Atkin Downs is genuinely really good, but he never even gets out the chair, or does anything really. They continue the disappointing trend of introducing new characters only to not develop them in any way, so they only exist to be a vendor. Seriously, stop doing this. You do not have a lack of characters, you just have a lack of any developed ones. If needing new vendors is such an issue, why not just pull a Warframe and let you pick up missions and bounties from your ship or something? However, before you're able to exact your revenge on the Barons, you have to do some busy work for the Spider to pad out the runtime a little. You do this by purchasing wanted bounties, but unable to purchase wanted bounties, you have to find ghost parts by doing dull patrols and public events. Luckily, Peter Vengeance gives you a kick-ass new weapon to play with, the Compound Bow. This thing is easily the most fun weapon that has ever been added to Destiny. The gameplay team absolutely killed it with how this weapon feels to use. It's probably the most fun bow I've used in any game, and I've played what? three games? I don't really understand how a contemporary Olympics looking bow fits aesthetically into the world of Destiny though, or into the western theme they were going for. It could definitely do with looking a little more sci-fi, but whatever, I'll take anything new. Ten seconds left. Two down. Very enough. Anyway, despite the fun new weapon, this was the least enjoyable part of the entire game for me. There is absolutely nothing fun about a campaign forcing you into doing side activities just so it takes longer to finish. It ruins the pacing and flow of the story, and it's just mind-numbingly dull. Not to mention that when you get hold of one of these bounties, which you have to do five of to continue the story, they give such vague instructions such as hunt down a prisoner of elders escapee hiding out in the drain in the EDZ. I could deal with this if it wasn't for two things. 1. Navigating the maps in Destiny is still a total nightmare, at least you actually have a map to look at this time around, but you can't place waypoints of your own accord, you can't zoom in, it's slow to load and they're under detailed for what you need. And 2. These enemy bounties just spawn in the open world maps, some of which are in areas populated by other players, so to get some of them to spawn you have to leave and join the same area multiple times until you wind up in an instance where one happens to appear. It was very frustrating. Pick and choose when you want to hold my 
hand destiny for God's sake. So to complete this section I had to google the bounty locations and follow a guide on the internet because I had no idea where these places were. Does this sound even remotely enjoyable to you? Because it's not. Now you've earned the spider's trust, he tips you off to the scorned barons location so your new goal is to assault their hideout. Petra is out for blood. But we're here for justice. Aren't we? Yeah, we're out for justice by carefully hunting down and murdering anyone that gets in our way by spilling our target's blood. Not really much difference there, I'm afraid. You recover a couple of spiders' caches, are forced to fight one of the same tanks they've been showing off since the original game came out. You're ambushed, and then you're teased by a bunch of the Koopalings, and the level ends with you killing a mini-boss. There's a weird, extremely goofy cutscene where each one of the barons gets a small introduction. Canics, the Mad Bomber. Emphasis on man. Reminds me of something a cartoon might do. It's extremely simplistic. I remember them doing it in one of the Transformers movies, and it was just as bad there. They tease that Aldrin is only at the Tangled Shore because of some mysterious place called the Watchtower, and six adventure missions pop up on your map, each labelled as one of the Barons. I made the stupid mistake of doing the first adventure right away, which has a power recommendation of 390, but I only had 360 power of my own, so this fight was difficult to the point of extreme frustration. The damn thing would kill me in two hits. I still really don't like the way Destiny handles difficulty. It doesn't make activities fun in a challenging way. You have no choice or control over it at all. It always just leaves you in one of two arbitrary states. You're either under leveled to the point where you'll die in two hits, or sometimes can't even deal damage to enemies because you're so weak, or you're so over leveled that everything is an absolute cakewalk. So what happened was completing this first Baron wound up taking about as much time on its own as all of the following ones combined, simply because I was slightly under leveled. I guess that's my fault for not realizing that I was supposed to grind. So I'm not going to go over every one of these bosses because I'd really quite like for this video to end eventually, but I'd say overall they're a mixed bag. I like how each boss has its own gimmick so it keeps things relatively fresh, especially the trickster who uses common destiny mechanics and features to, well, trick you. But one thing I really get tired of in Destiny boss encounters is how you can't just fight a big enemy on its own. You constantly have to fight hundreds of faceless minions at the same time, and we all know how I feel about minions. It kind of takes some of the punch away when a huge hulking boss goes invincible or hides for a few minutes until you deal with the mindless enemies around it. Makes them feel a lot less threatening, you know? I feel like they only do this because encounters would be far too easy otherwise, so they need to do something to hold you back. Just when you do this, it's kind of lame. This guy's file says he's obsessed with creating his own throne world, a pocket dimension in the Hive's ascendant plane. When the Hive kill powerful beings, their throne worlds increase in size. But that should only work for the Hive. What are you talking about? Somewhere in this expansion, you'll wind up unlocking a new move for your super that makes your previous ones irrelevant because they're so weak in comparison. I happen to get one of the less flashy ones for the Titan. It makes a big shield wall, which... At the time of me recording this seems to be super overpowered, but it's probably been nerfed by now. Aldrin goes to the Shard of the Traveler that gives you your powers back in the original campaign of Destiny 2. He shoots a hole in it and takes a bit for himself. Surely the Guardians should have tried to quarantine or recover this incredibly powerful piece of magic technology. No, you're just gonna leave it there in a field with a bunch of fallen. Okay. These guys are idiots. The penultimate Baron is after a pretty lame tank mission. I appreciate the attempt at trying to recapture the magic of Halo vehicle missions though. The sandbox is just so boring in comparison. We're on the last mission now, where you kill the final Baron. Whatever. Then my second least favorite enemies show up. They're taken. Well, at least they've only been reused for three years instead of four, like everything else has.
What the? What the f- what? So I guess Aldrin was being manipulated by this giant squid's asshole to free it from some realm. God damn, this is stupid. They never explain who or what this thing is. I looked on the wiki and apparently it's a shape-shifting creature that was made taken by Oryx and manipulated Aldrin into freeing her from the Dreaming City. A major turning point for Destiny's storytelling. So after you kill the squid, I guess Aldrin is fine now and wasn't eaten alive. The only reason you fight a squid instead of Aldrin is probably because this is a game for babies, so they can't have you shooting at human-like figures. God damn, this is an unsatisfying ending though. Imagine if at the end of Gladiator, it was revealed that a ghost squid is what made the Emperor's son issue the kill command on Russell Crowe's family. It would kind of completely ruin the entire point of a revenge story, wouldn't it? So... This is to be a reckoning. Come on, he's being manipulated by a giant squid. Give the guy a break. <sighs> Funny. The line between light and dark is so very thin. Do you know which side you're on? I swear, if they tried to pull the you were a villain the whole time twist the original game was supposed to have, I'm gonna lose my mind. Anyway, you show no mercy at all and shoot Aldrin at the same time as the blue woman. Don't you have a prison that you can go in? They try to show that what you're doing is justified, but if you really believed in justice, surely you would take all of the barons back to the prison. That's what Mario would do. He's a true hero. Oh my god, so it's over. Well, so that's the end of the story. That was so, so, so bad. We learned nothing about any character. The plot was so simple that a toddler could follow it. And the one thing they promised, revenge, you get slighted from you because of the stupid squid reveal. I don't want to fight a squid, I wanted to fight Aldrin. Who thought this would be a good idea? I think I might hate this even more than the original story for Destiny. At least everyone was in agreement that that one sucked. The thing that hurts me most when looking back at everything in Destiny now, is that there are enough art assets, characters, weapons, music, landscapes and lore, to tell an interesting Mass Effect style character based story, buried way deep in here somewhere. I saw this complex flowchart of how each piece of content has led to where we are in Destiny at this point, and imagine how cool it would be if any of this had weight, drive, and character growth behind it. But because this game has to be an online service, everything has to be half-baked and lean more towards grinding than anything else. Which I guess nicely leads us into the... The end game is personally where I usually peter out because I'm more of a story guy, but the never ending grind for loot is what attracts most people to this game. So how is it? Well, it's certainly better than Destiny 2 Vanilla, that's for sure. In this regard, it might even be better than any state the original game ever ended up being in. Quality of life changes such as the Triumph achievements, make sure you buy the best edition for the Triumph, in-game lore tab for the hardcore fans, collections so you can see what weapons and armor you're missing and how to get it, are all much needed changes hardcore fans have been after for a while. It's basically the bare, essential stuff you'd expect in a game of this type. I'm sure plenty of people will get a lot out of pain stakingly customizing their characters by grinding for thousands of hours. And that's all Destiny is for at the moment. Hardcore fans of Destiny and hardcore fans of RNG loot grinds. They seem to have slowed down the unlocking of new content so players won't blast through it so quick and hit the level cap instantly, like in every other expansion and game previous. Which seems like a good change. I don't know. It gives people something to chase. They even have an entire endgame area that you never really go to in the main story, aside from one mission that kind of unlocks it. This map is really Really cool and is full of a bunch of mysteries that supposedly change every week on a rotor. This game really seems to excel when it keeps itself shrouded in secrecy and not trying to explain why giant squids are controlling blue dudes who killed a robot voiced by Nolan North. In my opinion, this game would be so much better if they leaned into what they were actually good at, which is how good the shooting feels and the concept of varied interesting loot to chase in a mysterious environment. The past four years have proven that Bungie are simply not very good at telling traditional narrative in this universe, so why not use that weakness to their advantage and tie the lack of a cinematic story into gameplay instead? People absolutely love a mystery. You just have to look at the success of something like Souls Dark. 
Make people explore your big empty maps. Litter them with things to collect and environmental storytelling to find. The most fun I had in this game was exploring these caves for mysteries and chests all on my own accord, without the bad dialogue or cutscenes. Move away from these expensive, time-consuming, pointless cinematics that are embarrassingly bad, and use the extra resources to improve what is already there. If shooting is fun, and literally the only thing you do, then make it better. Make it more varied with a wider selection of enemies, more creative weapons, more player agency and choice, with other types of gameplay like ship combat to break up the repetition a bit. Let the impeccable art design and music speak for itself a little more. You're a video game, you don't have to just copy movies. With just the music and the art alone, you already have a fantastic atmosphere. You just need the mechanical backbone to hold everything else up. I should not be frustrated at how little control I have over customizing my character in a game that is about customizing my character. It seems like the design of the game fights against every choice that I want to make. For most of my time playing this expansion, I hated the way my character looked. I hate these shoulders, look, they just glitch through in the cutscenes. And this is because of the way the game forces you to chase power levels. I know you have the option to infuse power items that you like, but as a new PC player, I have no materials to do it with. And at the time of me writing this, the drop rate is so low for masterwork cores, which is what you have to use to upgrade weapons now, that I never once even used this feature. What was the point? Shaders being one-time use is also still a complete joke. Even the most passionate Destiny players won't disagree with me on this one. You can't give us a feature in Destiny 1 that worked fine, then bring it back in the sequel with dreadful implementation and expect everyone to just be okay with it. It encourages hoarding because you want to save your colours until you get the perfect drop that you're looking for, which, in such an RNG-based game, could be a long, long time. I guess selling them for real money is more important. Back to a couple more positives though. The strike playlist is a lot more fun than in vanilla. The amount of them now is a lot greater than before because of all the content that has been released up to this point, and some of them are quite fun. It was actually a viable way to level up as well. I still really despise the fact that PS4 players get a plethora of extra content because of their deal with Sony though. I normally don't care about this kind of thing, but in a game like this, where it actually matters, it's really frustrating. And it's kind of a massive kick in the teeth, especially when the Triumph system constantly reminds you about the cool stuff that you literally cannot get until the exclusivity timer runs out. And even then, that's like a year. I'm not going to care in a year. There's a new raid as well that I can't be bothered to play because I don't want to grind to be strong enough for it. I'm sure it's fun. It's especially interesting how, after the new raid was first completed, new events actually affected the world as a result. That's the impactful feeling that is lacking from the campaign content. More of that, please. I actually played a bunch of multiplayer this time around, which I've always bashed for being lame and bad before, but I actually had a good time. It doesn't suffer from the immense boredom that comes from the repetition of the dull AI enemies in PvE. It feels a lot more balanced and snappy than Vanilla did, but also not slowed down to the point where everything was kind of droll. But where this game really shines is in the new PvE VP mode called Gambit, where you have to work with your team to collect moats from AI enemies and bank them before your opposing team can on their side of the map, with every now and again a portal open so one of your team can jump through into the enemy's map and you can hunt down the opposing players while they're still trying to kill their AI. It's an extremely complicated concept to try and explain, but trust me, within a round it makes perfect sense. It's vaguely like that terrible mode from Halo 5 called Warzone, but imagine if it was actually well designed and wasn't a broken mess of one-time use items and microtransactions. I noticed Gambit had a couple of balancing issues at the moment, but I'm sure that'll be fixed as time goes by. Can't believe I'm actually praising the PvP in this game, but they actually seem to have done a decent job this time around. Take this with a grain of salt though, I'm not exactly an expert in PvP or anything. I just have fun because of how tense and unpredictable it was, unlike in the PvE stuff. It also shows how the mechanics of this game can shine when put in the right setting. I mentioned earlier that on the planet map in Destiny 2, you're constantly teased with something called the Annual Pass. It seems they've ditched the idea of a Season Pass because of how much controversy and hatred it seemed to garner, but I'm still not a fan on the way they insist on monetizing this game. There's no mention of anything story related, so it seems like they're moving away from the stupid cutscenes, and will hopefully be focusing on improving the scope of gameplay. Based on the history of Destiny and how all over the place their content drops have been, I'd really advise to hold off buying this until they really prove that it's 
worth it. I never trust these vague descriptions, these types of passes promise, but only time will tell if this turns out to be a better or worse deal than the original season passes. Well, now's the part of the video where I complain about Eververse. It's probably the worst thing about the game, if I'm being honest. It's not enough that you have to pay full price for Destiny 2 and its various expansions, but of course they are to try and nickel and dime you by gating off content behind this insulting vendor. I know people like to try and defend it by saying it's only cosmetic, which is already a crap excuse, and also isn't true, because you can buy armor that has gameplay perks attached to it, but we're talking about a game where the main goal is to collect cosmetics for customizing your character. So instead of expanding the loot pool for the other types of content, with all these art assets that are being tailor-made for this one vendor, even with exclusive stuff sometimes, they instead specifically made a reward system that is designed to constantly bring you back to this menu screen, like a mobile game basically, in a sleazy attempt to get you to purchase silver, their BS fake currency, which is also a total ripoff. I warned about this when they first introduced Eververse into Destiny 1, and it's only gotten worse. Please do not spend any money on this, even if you like the game. At the very least, you have bounties which you can do to help you earn bright dust which lets you purchase things that are gated off behind this, but it's still incredibly sad that you even have to do this at all. Another sickening detail is what they're charging for these forsaken character boosts, which are 3,000 silver, aka 23 99 in the UK. What a completely absurd amount of money just to be able to quickly play the content I paid for in the game that encourages you to have more than one character so you can experience everything. I really wanted to try out the other new character classes for this video to see how much fun they were, but I'd have to grind so much content that it would not even be worth my time, and I'm sure as hell not going to hand over 50 quid just for the sake of doing so. All in all, Destiny Forsaken seems to be hitting the spot for what Destiny players are looking for, but there wasn't much here that I found very impressive or worth the time. The story was pitifully bad. The level design in the campaign is pretty lackluster. Gameplay variety is sorely lacking, and I still don't like how little control I have over customizing my character or the way I like to play. That's not to say that I didn't have any fun at all, but I found that for every positive, I had an equal negative to match. Destiny still manages to be not much more than Skype with gameplay, and I find it much harder to forgive the inane repetition of history. We should not be in the same place the original Destiny was after two years, four years later, and I fear that in another two years, we're gonna be in the same place again. I really hope they're not doing this on purpose, because that would be sick. For the love of God, Bungie, just build on what works instead of stripping it down in an attempt to appeal to the casual market and annoying everyone as a result. Why abandon all the previous years of work anyway? Stop wasting time trying to develop cinematic cutscene-based stories when the majority of people playing the game are racing through with their friends as fast as they can to get to the end game and are probably making fun of the cutscenes while they're playing in a party anyway. Stop doing your best to manipulate people into buying microtransactions just so players have some control over the customization they want. I really don't know what I expect from the same company that has embraced the random rolls RNG so hard that on their official merch store they sell weapon pins that themselves are a one pin per package order with a chance for a rare pin. Says it all really, doesn't it?